as well as a balance at the top of the atmosphere to get the outgoing radiation equal to the incoming, there has to be a surface energy balance. Um, and once you satisfy the surface energy balance, then that determines where this intercept is. And then given the lapse rate, it determines where the tropopause is. So one difference between the middle latitudes and the tropics is that the lapse rate is different. Um, then it gives you this prediction. So the tropopause height must go up with global warming. So more greenhouse effects gives you uh, more warming. And of course, the planet with the biggest greenhouse effect in the solar system, well, depending on how you define an atmosphere, is, uh, is Venus, which is kind of similar to Earth in some ways, but different in others. Radiatively, the surface pressure is 92 bars. Um, 100 times that of Earth. It's all carbon dioxide. So you're thinking, you know, when we talk about global warming, we're talking about going from, you know, 300 parts per million to 600 parts per million. Venus has got about a million parts per million. Uh, so, you know, already it's 1,000, 3,000 times more concentration. 3,000 and 100 times more atmosphere, so 300,000 times more carbon dioxide. So the greenhouse effect. But there's so much greenhouse, the pressure, there's so much greenhouse that if, if Venus were a little bit colder, it would actually condense and rain carbon dioxide because it would, the pressure would exceed the saturation vapor pressure of carbon dioxide. So we're almost on the verge of actually getting carbon dioxide rain on Venus. Uh, the reason we don't get carbon dioxide rain on Venus is actually because, because it's so warm, because there's so much carbon dioxide. Uh, so, uh, so the surface temperature is about 700 degrees Kelvin. So that's above the saturation vapor pressure. But if, if Venus, if carbon dioxide were not such a greenhouse gas and the temperature were cooler, some of the carbon dioxide would condense out and you would get rain. Anyway, that's a, a snippet. So surface pressure is 92 bars, enormous greenhouse effects. So we expect the tropopause to be higher by our previous arguments. And ta-da, there it is. These are actually profiles from the Pioneer mission. Uh, it's kind of interesting. They had trouble with these, of course, because they get crushed on the way down, but some of them were successful. Uh, so these are profiles in various places in, in uh, Venus. Here's about the tropopause, 60 kilometers high. Um, and Venus, as far as I know, has no, um, it has clouds, it doesn't have towering cumulonimbus, as far as I know. Um, it has lots of clouds actually above the tropopause up here. Um, so it, is, it has convection. Uh, no cumulonimbus, no ozone. Still has a tropopause. Nearly all the planets in, in the solar system have uh, one form of a tropopause or another. It's a very robust feature of the planetary atmosphere. Um, um, the other interesting thing about Venus is that these are all in different, quite different latitudes, different locations, but the temperature is almost the same in all of them. Venus is enormously isothermal uh, until you get to very high latitudes. And part of that, it, the reason for that is because the Hadley cell is so big, as we talked about earlier. The Hadley cell goes to about 60 degrees uh, north and south. And in the period of that Hadley cell, in the extent of that Hadley cell, the temperature is varying very little um, indeed. And that's the lack of temperature variation has been confirmed by later measurements uh, than these. So, OK, the last 
maybe. Probably not going to get onto the middle attitudes, guys. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm probably not actually going to talk about the bolus flux uh, after all. Oh, well. Uh, see, I told you my timing wasn't very good. Why? Oh, because it's not in radiative equilibrium. If it were, if it were in radiative equilibrium, it would be uniform. But obviously, it's not in radiative equilibrium. I don't know what determines this particular thing here. Um, you actually have clouds up here, which are emitting infrared. Um, so it's certainly not. So the tropopause isn't really sharp. It's kind of a merger up here. But yeah, a lot of clouds up here. Uh, sulfuric acid clouds, not nice rain clouds. Yeah? Venus is not in radiative equilibrium, or is this a... Well, the, no, the entire planet, of course, is in radiative equilibrium. Okay, just that one. Yeah, the, just the... the um, but up here, it's, uh, it's probably not in radiative equilibrium. But of course, the entire planet is in radiative equilibrium. <laughs> And in fact, the, incoming, the net incoming solar radiation on Venus is very similar to that of Earth. Venus is closer to the sun, um, so it gets more uh, gross incoming solar radiation, but it has a quite a high albedo because it's covered in clouds. Uh, so it reflects more. So the net incoming solar is quite similar to that of Earth. And uh, nonetheless, pretty toasty down here. Uh, you wouldn't want to... Uh, you get crushed and, and roasted. I don't know. I guess the crushing would kill you first. I don't know. <laughs> would you die first? I don't know. Let's look. Anyway, okay. Let's, uh, let's not worry about that. Uh, I don't know whether this will be the last. I just wanted to have a little, since we've been talking about radiation and since Brian talked about ice albedo, I thought I'd talk a little bit about water vapor radiative feedback in a very simple way. Ice albedo feedback is sort of relatively simple to understand. Some initial change, say it gives you cooling, increased snow and ice, high reflectivity. Less solar radiation, more cooling. Round and round you go. Water vapor radiative feedback, again, not of a similar ilk. Um, Suppose you have a warming perturbation. Um, you get increased atmospheric water vapor, uh, more greenhouse effect, more warming. Um, we tend to argue them these ways. Uh, there's no reason why these arrows can't go the other way around. I mean, ice albedo feedback can be a warming feedback, and the greenhouse, uh, greenhouse effect can be a cooling feedback if you <coughs> reduce the temperature you get less water vapor and it gets colder and, and so on and so forth. But uh, uh, So it's nice to have these feedbacks. I mean, the uh, cloud feedbacks, a bit of a diversion. One of the problems of climate science is that there is no nice loop. We kind of, you know, what would the loop be? You know, if it warms, do you get more clouds or less clouds? And part of the problem there is it depends upon the type of cloud in detailed ways. So low-level clouds tend to have a high albedo, but not much of a greenhouse effect. Um, so they would cool the Earth. High clouds might do the opposite. Uh, not a particularly big albedo effect. Um, they do have a greenhouse effect, so they might warm the Earth. Uh, Thick clouds, who knows what they do? And then it, who knows how they change with global warming? So, um, so that's why there's no lecture on clouds. <laughs> or, or none for me, anyway. Um, let's try and um, think about just multiple equilibrium due to water vapor. Um, this is perhaps the simplest possible EBM. You can see um, epsilon sigma t to the fourth is S1 minus alpha. T is temperature, say, 
Earth has one temperature. Sigma is Stefan's constant. S is the incoming solar radiation. Alpha is the albedo. And epsilon is something uh, there which, because the Earth is not a black body. So um, if we imagine epsilon to be the surface, I'm sorry, T is the surface temperature, uh, then certainly we need epsilon to be less than 1 in order to get the surface temperature more or less equal to the observed surface temperature. If we just take epsilon equals to 1, put in known values for the right-hand side, we get a well-known value for the surface temperature of about 255 Kelvin, some, some 20 or so degrees colder than it should be. Um, so we want to fix that. We fix it with an epsilon. So ice albedo feedback just makes alpha, the albedo, a function of temperature. I want to make this emissivity a function of temperature. And I'm going to do that because there's more water. As the atmosphere gets warmer, you get more water vapor, more greenhouse effect. That's more or less the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. If the zero-off order approximation to how much water vapor there is at any given place is the temperature. If the temperature is higher, a given volume can hold more water vapor. And that's the classiest Clapeyron relation. So where it's hot, you get more water. Where it's cold, you get less. So for example, and that, we don't always process that. Um, so we think of England as being rainy, which kind of is. <laughs> but, it, but in fact, if you compare London to New York, London has more rain days. Um, the average rainfall in London per year is something like 50 centimeters per year. New York, the average rainfall is about 100 centimeters per year. It's twice as much in New York. Uh, we, and the reason for that is it rains heavily, more heavily when it does rain in New York than it does in London, because it's hotter, by and large. Um, so, um, so temperature is the zero of order approximant to how much water vapor is. And the Clancy's Clapeyron, the solution of the Clancy's Clapeyron equation tells us that the water vapor vapor pressure increase, increases approximately exponentially with temperature. Not exactly exponentially, but uh, more or less. So let's go back to our, let's also not worry about convection. Uh, we, could, we could put that in, but let's not worry about it. For now, let's go back to our um, radiative equilibrium model, which tells us that the surface temperature is equal to the emitting temperature times 1 plus tau naught. The tau naught is the optical depth at the surface. So a bigger optical depth gives us a bigger surface temperature. This emitting temperature here is just solar constant times 1 minus the albedo. Uh, so we know that. Uh, we'll take albedo to be fixed, 1 plus tau naught. So that our epsilon, you know, in our previous slide, we had epsilon sigma t to the fourth. Now, if sigma t to the fourth is this times 1 plus tau, so our epsilon from the previous slide is just 1 plus tau naught, the inverse of 1 plus tau naught. So for the simplest model, let's make our water vapor feedback, let's make our tau naught a function of temperature A plus B times the saturation vapor pressure which is this exponential function of temperature, e to the gamma t. So then we can put this in here. So then we have sigma t to the fourth equals s, 1 minus a, 1 plus tau, and tau is a plus b is this exponential function of temperature. So now we have a 
a more complicated equation to solve um, with the possibility of multiple equilibrium. Um, and because we can imagine we can get a cold, dry climate would be one solution with a low tropopause, of course, or a warm, wet climate. Uh, now, whether we actually get that on Earth, uh, you, you certainly couldn't use a simple model like this to predict whether you get that on Earth, but um, we get the idea that there might be more than one solution. Um, so we can just, well, one thing we can, we can solve this equation. It's a, it's a bit tricky to solve that analytically because we've got an exponential function here, which is and uh, sigma t to the fourth here, but we can solve it graphically or numerically. So I'll do it two ways. One, I'll just plot the surface temperature. I'll just plot the left and the right-hand side and see where they intersect. And that's what I've done on this left-hand plot here. This is actually just the surface temperature. The dashed line is the surface temperature increasing. And this is the right-hand side. So we actually get two solutions there and there for a given solar constant. Uh, a warm, wet solution and a cold, dry solution. And then if I actually plot it for a whole range of emitting temperatures, uh, this, is the, this is the ground temperature, this is the emitting temperature, which we know, uh, we get two solutions. And it's kind of interesting um, that we get two solutions and that in this solution is sort of what we expect that if we turn the solar constant up the surface warms this solution here if we go from here to here turn the, turn the uh, emitting temperature up turn the solar constant up the ground temperature goes down um, and we saw that kind of behaviour in, uh, in some of Brian's curves yesterday with ice albedo feedback, and it's very similar. And if you go to here, you can kind of see it if you go to this curve. Here I can, I now have some colored chalk. Uh, So here's uh, the surface temperature. Here's uh, one curve. Now, suppose I increase the emitting temperature. So this is my emitting temperature, which is really like the solar constant, 1 minus. If I increase the solar constant, That curve is going to go like this. So the surface temperature of the lower solution will go up. The surface temperature of my other solution will go down. Uh, so, um, so we get this additional branch. Uh, and it turns out that this branch is actually unstable if you're actually sitting on here, if you found a solution, and somebody comes and kicks you, you'll actually fall down to here. Um, so it's kind of interesting you see, you can see what's happening suppose you're sitting here we're on earth and uh, earth moves towards the sun major mistake in a geoengineering project <laughs> uh, and uh, we move towards the sun. It gets warmer and warmer. And then oh, what happens here? So in this model, you then cease to find a solution. You cannot find a solution. Temperature, there isn't a solution. It uh, becomes infinite uh, in this model. And that, well, that will be an extreme example of runaway greenhouse. Um, you're just getting, just getting warmer and warmer. And uh, now, of course, there's something wrong 
with this model. Uh, and this is one of the limitations of gray radiation. We're assuming that uh, the entire emission <coughs> here, uh, the sigma t to the fourth, uh, which is a function of tau, which is a function of water vapor, all of the emission is affected by the uh, presence of water vapor. In fact, things aren't quite as bad as they seem because there are windows, appropriately named windows, where radiation can escape from the Earth's surface more, more or less unimpeded by the presence of, uh, of absorbers in the atmosphere. So there are infrared windows, and we can add an infrared window to our model by, I suppose, just by... I don't think I've actually written down the equations. No. By, um, in a sense, uh, making the emission have two bands to it, one of which is affected by the absorption of water vapor, and one of which the radiation can escape anyway, uh, no matter what, which is a little bit more realistic. And then I put that in to the model. Uh, so look at this curve. And then any guesses what will happen when I add another band? Any, uh, no penalty for being wrong? Uh, what's going to happen is we're going to get another band up here. So this, these curves kind of look really quite similar in a qualitative way to the curves that you get with ice albedo feedback. So this is one branch, perhaps the branch we're on. Um, this is an unstable branch, and this is a very um, hot branch. And now, probably, um, Earth doesn't have a behavior like this. You'd have to do a more complicated model uh, to do this. Uh, and you can, you can calculate this with a little Python code. Uh, so I can make this Python code available to anybody. It's, it's like 100 lines of Python to do this. Uh, and it iterates to find, us, to find the solutions. Um, but, you know, you, you're going along here. You, Earth is getting closer to the sun. And you get to this point, and then you would shoot up to here to find the solution. So this is a slightly less extreme runaway greenhouse. Uh, but it's actually seriously believed that Venus went through this uh, process by looking at the um, isotopic composition of its atmosphere. It looked like it might have had a liquid ocean uh, a long, long time ago. Uh, but that, but it, the liquid ocean boiled, the atmosphere became saturated, it got warmer and warmer. Uh, in fact, it got so much warmer that the, uh, the water vapor was lost to space, disassociated, and was lost to space. And now we no longer have any water vapor on Venus. But we still have a very strong greenhouse effect. So, um, so that's, uh, uh, that's multiple equilibrium. You can also, although I probably should have shown this, but I haven't, you can, you can actually add then ice albedo feedback to this model by making alpha a function of temperature. So, so you can have a joint ice albedo feedback and a uh, moist radiated feedback. And uh, what happens then is that uh, one or two, either this branch or this branch, will themselves bifurcate. And, you, and this branch itself, which is probably more likely, because there's no ice up here, would bifurcate. And you get a, a very cold. You get two branches because of the ice albedo down there. So, um, so it's kind of fun to play with these models. And uh, it's, uh, it was one way I taught myself Python was to write up this little model. Uh, it's quite fun. Um, then in my last 10 minutes, I will, or whatever, I'll try and finish 
12 ish. Um, I will actually talk about scales of motion. Come back, so back to dynamics. <coughs> scales of motion in the tropics and mid latitudes. Um, and just introduce you to one important concept called a weak temperature gradient approximation. Um, the weak temperature gradient approximation says temperature gradients are weak in the tropics. I think that term was coined by Chris Bretherton. Um, turns out the idea actually is due to Charney. Uh, in meteorology, Charney, all roads go back to Charney in a sense. Um, but it's also a nice notion of scaling. Okay, B is temperature again. These are the equations of motion for an atmosphere. Actually, it's a Boussinesque atmosphere, but it doesn't matter. Um, you know, U is um, horizontal velocity Coriolis, the advector derivative pressure. This is the hydrostatic equation. It's the thermodynamic equation. So N squared is the stratification. W is the vertical velocity. And there's the um, mass conservation equation. Um, this uses the Boussinesque equation. It's actually um, almost the same equations occur in pressure coordinates. So if you're actually a, if you're actually a dyed in the wool meteorologist and you like pressure coordinates, then you, you can just change uh, Z for P and you more or less get the same equations. And you still get this incompressible equation in pressure coordinates. But if you're not a dyed in the wool meteorologist, the notion of actually using pressure as an independent variable seems totally weird because pressure, you know, pressure is a, it's a field. You, you wouldn't think of using velocity as a coordinate. But, uh, but, uh, but anyway, so I kind of like to think of, it's my oceanographic heritage coming back. I like to think of the Boutonesque equations. So then you just, non, you just scale the equations. So what that means is you, you say that horizontal scales are about a scale L, Z is some scale height, H, etc. cetera. Um, and then what happens then is you get a bunch of non-dimensional numbers which pop out. And the equations are written in non-dimensional form. Um, these familiar non-dimensional numbers pop up, the Rosby number, the Berger number, the Richardson number, famous names. Uh, Richardson was the, um, well, Rosby, we all know who Rosby was, a famous Swedish meteorologist, founded the departments in Chicago and MIT largely. Richardson was um, L.F. Richardson, Lewis Fry Richardson. He was a British meteorologist at the turn of the century, last century. He was one of the, um, he envisioned numerical weather prediction. That's what he's most famous for. And he actually tried to do numerical weather prediction um, by himself, by hand. So he differenced the equations and then tried to solve them by hand to give a forecast. And it was, it was he, he got a pretty bad forecast, <laughs> a very bad forecast, because, well, not only his resolution was wrong, um, he didn't know about gravity waves, so he got enormous gravity waves dominating his solution. Uh, and it was completely wrong, but it was a pioneering effort. Uh, and he actually envisioned and you can read about this in a biography of him, that the future of numerical weather prediction will be there be like a concert hall, like, in fact, like this. You'd all be sitting here, and I'd be saying, you calculate the derivative over in this grid point, and you do this, and you do the thermodynamic equation, and you'd all be calculating by hand, and the results would be passed to somebody who would collect them together, and then you'd go forward a time step, and then you'd all repeat it, you see? It would be, I mean, not only, 
did he envision numerical weather forecasting? He actually envisioned parallel computing. <laughs> now you have a thousand people in the, in the hall and they're all doing calculations and there's a little controller here and there's a little, you know, a high network band, you know, passing between the two. So anyway, and then of course, the first successful numerical weather prediction was, or semi, uh, passable numerical was Charney, Charney again, Fjortoft and von Neumann in, uh, in the early 50s using a very simplified set of equations and, uh, in, uh, in Princeton. So Richardson was uh, a pacifist. He drove ambulances and he resigned from the UK Met Office because it became part of a Ministry of Defence so he didn't want to. Interesting fellow. Um, okay, anyway, the thing about, back to, uh, back to the weak temperature approximation. Let's take the momentum equation and the hydrostatic equation and scale them. So that tells us that the pressure, this equation, scales as F times U uh, times L because this vertical derivative is a this derivative here is a horizontal derivative so it's, it's d5 by dx so you get an, an L here and then the buoyancy is phi over z so it's ful over h that's where you get in mid latitude simple scaling the tropics there's no f key difference f is zero to leading order, sort of. Uh, so this scales, this term here scales like u, u squared over L. Uh, so the pressure scales like u squared. So, so now u squared, F, if we compare how big these, are, these two fields are, F times u, F naught, which is the middle latitude value of u, is going to be bigger, I'm sorry, it's going to be smaller. It's going to be bigger <laughs> uh, than u squared. u squared is less, is less than f naught ul. u squared is less because f is big. Okay? So variations of pressure and temperature are smaller in mid latitudes than they are in the tropics. Right, u squared is u squared is less than f u l. That's a small Rosby number of assumption. So that is the weak temperature gradient approximation. Variations of pressure and temperature are smaller. There's actually a bit of a hidden assumption here. Um, the hidden assumption is that the actual winds are similar, or at least not any bigger, in the tropics than they are in mid latitudes. If they were bigger, you could kind of, you know, invert the argument or something like that. You might say, okay, well, let's suppose the pressure gradients are the same in mid latitudes and the tropics. Then uh, you would have to have very big winds in the tropics. Uh, but in fact, we argue, or it is conventionally argued that the winds are about the same, so the pressure gradients are less and therefore the temperature gradients are less in the tropics. And that's the essence of the weak temperature gradient approximation. And that comes from Charney. Uh, I forget exactly when. Um, and um, does it work? Here is a snapshot of pressure, temperature, and wind. So this is pressure, essentially, geopotential temperature, and the wind on a particular day, I chose this day because it happened to be my birthday. I thought it was an auspicious day. So, so uh, I went to the wind and uh, there's a nice blocking high over the UK then. But you can see, look at, look at the wind, look at, sorry, look at the geopotential. Almost no gradient of pressure in the tropics. Compared to the winds, 
I mean, just look at, you can just blur your eyes, stand back and look at the, there's the same number of contours in each plot. So we're not deceiving you, the same number of contours in each plot. And uh, so there's a lot of variability of the winds, but very little variability of the geopotential, very little variability of the, of the, uh, uh, of the temperature. So that's the weak temperature gradient approximation. The, um, Is this surface temperature? Uh, no, it's um, uh, it's not surface temperature. It's it's probably 500 hectopascals, but I cannot remember. Yeah, if uh, wind is similar magnitude, yeah. because of Coriolis parameter, phi uh, should be a smaller than the tropics. Yes, phi should be. It's a simple consequence. Yeah. Geometry. Yeah. So why you, 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 Wait a minute. No, no, you have, to, you, you have to invoke the dynamics. You have to invoke F. If the winds are similar, phi has to be smaller because, of, because there's no Coriolis parameter in here. Yeah, that's the argument. It's a simple argument. I'm not invoking a... It's not a complicated argument. Pardon? Geostrophic wind. Yes, yeah, it's... The wind is geostrophic in middle latitudes, but it's not geostrophic in low latitudes. Uh, so, uh, but if the wind is approximately the same in the tropics and middle latitudes, the pressure gradient has to be smaller. Um, so that's a, fel that's a relatively simple argument, and um, uh, which seems to hold. And the um, this was. Extended actually by um, Sobel, Nielsen, and Paul Varney. Um, because what you want to get, and this is sort of, this is going to be my last slide, so I'll finish at 12. Um, what meteorologists want to get are simplified equations that they can actually integrate and step forward. And here are just uh, the shallow water equations, uh, sort of in full form. It's, they're primitive equations, if you will. They've got three time derivatives. Um, one for the height field, one for the vorticity, and one for the divergence. If you make this weak temperature gradient approximation, um, what you actually end up with is this time derivative and this time derivative go away and you end up with a, a single time derivative for the vorticity. So you've actually ended up filtering gravity waves and you have a, it's a formally at least simpler set of equations for, uh, uh, for the equations of motion in the tropics. It's sort of analogous to the quasi-geostrophic equations in mid-latitudes and that you've made some filtering assumptions, got rid of some time derivatives. Um, but it's actually become less... It's not as useful in some ways as the quasi-geostrophic approximation because the difficulty of the tropics uh, from a scientist's point of view is that it's very hard to make simple equations relevant and the relevant equations tend not to be simple so there's a, a, a bigger gap there but you, I mean you want to have both um, but the, the closest that the tropical meteorologists come to in, in making a simplified set of equations is to use something like these equations along with this quasi-equilibrium assumptions I was talking about before, though I didn't use that name, in which we impose a particular vertical structure for the atmosphere because we assume that the convection relaxes it back to the moist adiabatic lapse rate. So we get rid of all the vertical structure in one fell swoop. And then we make these equations, the weak temperature gradient equations. Um, they still tend to be a complicated set of equations. Um, so you wouldn't actually use so they've had well it depends who you 
where you're coming from, whether you think they've been successful or not. Um, and uh, that's the first half of my lectures. <laughs> so I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.